Thank you so much uh, and welcome everyone for, uh, for this session. Uh, before I run through the agenda, if we can remove uh, the slide for a second, um, I would like to start by saying that um, the cluster system was created, um, I think 16 years ago, almost to the month. Uh, for one basic reason is that protection problems are, are complex, are wicked, uh, and not we cannot find one single actor who can alone tackle these kinds of problems. So we need an alliance and hence the cluster was created. But also protection problems in themselves are, are very complicated. They are multifaceted. But as we said at the beginning of, uh, of the forum yesterday, the main challenge across all kinds of protection problems that we face today is the fact that we have this sense of invisibility of the survivors and the victims. So we have a sense of invisibility. We have a sense of one organization or actor cannot tackle it alone. And if we take these two concepts and look at trafficking, in persons. I don't think there is any more true series of crimes for which these two notions come together. Invisibility and the need for multiple actors to come together across multiple years to be able to tackle it. These are known facts and we try to work on them. And we, end to, we add today a layer that is technology. Technology comes in, in many ways, shapes or form. It has a lot of advantages that should be captured, but it's also one more space where we see that there are challenges where uh, criminals and traffickers are savvy as much as the general public. So we can see a force of good that could be used as an additional platform to commit crimes. And bringing these three notions together, protection, the need for dismantling invisibility, collaboration, the need to have a cluster and a group of an alliance to come together, and technology, that is a space that is wide and open and good and bad and all of it and bring them all together, I think that would make a fantastic conversation to bring these three notions to, together. And the, the panelists we have with us today are uh, as diverse and colorful and come from different angles as much as the, this wicked problem requires. So if we can put the agenda on, I'm very glad that today with us to address this problem, we have split our sessions to two main parts. The first is to listen to, uh, to experts, to people, to individuals that have vested personal interest plus expertise in guiding us and giving us opinions and, uh, and perspectives on how to address this issue. That will be roughly the first 45 minutes of the session. The second 45 minutes is for you, the 129 participants that are with us this afternoon. The idea is first to hear from, from the experts and then to hear from you, from the different countries where you are in. And I would be very pleased if uh, you participants can type quickly in the chat box from which operation, which country, are you joining us today? That would give us a sense of, of diversity. So back to the first part of, of today. Uh, we will uh, hear from uh, Walk Free Foundation, uh, Grace uh, Forrest, yes. who will be uh, uh, speaking to us about her personal interest and in the foundation work uh, in this area. 
It will, she will be followed by the uh, special rapporteur on trafficking in person, Siobhan. Siobhan is not a stranger for the global protection cluster. Uh, and she has been with us uh, uh, during uh, the first forum uh, last year. We're also joined by uh, Hannah Darnton. Hannah, uh, I will introduce her more appropriately uh, when she speaks, but she brings with her both a personal uh, investment in this area, as well as, uh, as an institutional uh, engagement in, uh, in technology against trafficking. And uh, finally, we will have with us uh, one of my, my personal heroes, uh, Mayerlin uh, Vergara Perez, who is the founder of Renacer, uh, working to combat trafficking uh, uh, in Colombia. So without further ado, and really with, uh, with the enthusiasm and the curiosity that this topic brings, I would like to hand over to you, Grace, uh, to open this uh, for us, give us an inject of, uh, of ideas and motivation on how we tackle this wicked problem. Grace, over to you. Thank you so much, William. And thank you for the opportunity to provide opening remarks today on the role of technology in tackling modern slavery in crisis settings. At Walk Free, an international human rights group focused on accelerating the end of all forms of modern slavery, we recognise that innovation in technology provides great opportunity for us to fight modern slavery everywhere it occurs. And so I'm so pleased to join you to learn more about the opportunities and importantly, the challenges and limitations of technology to counter human trafficking. Let me set the scene for this discussion. In 2021, an estimated 235 million people will need humanitarian assistance and protection at a cost of 35.1 billion US dollars. This is a 40% increase on 2020 and is almost entirely as a result of COVID-19. Crisis situations increase the prevalence of modern slavery and people's vulnerability to modern slavery. In conflict situations and crisis situations, we see this vulnerability exacerbated tenfold so through things such as the erosion of the rule of law, breakdown in protections and the normalization of violence. It makes it much easier to exercise coercion. For example, armed groups take advantage of the situation to exploit children as child soldiers or force into individuals into labor situations. Women and girls are particularly vulnerable due to increased incidence of gender-based violence and sexual violence. This includes forced child and early marriage and forced sexual exploitation. It's vital that we acknowledge the intersectionality of the big issues we are facing in the world today. Environmental issues, political instability, the erosion of justice and the rule of law and conflict and war all contribute to vulnerability to modern slavery. For example, such crises can lead to migration and displacement, which exacerbate vulnerability. There are currently 82.4 million people forcibly displaced globally, of which 48 million are internally displaced people. 26.4 million are refugees and 4.1 million are asylum seekers. During times of crisis, it is highly likely that migration is unplanned and at higher risk. Mass movement makes it difficult for protection actors to identify and respond to this risk and create circumstances where criminal networks may take advantage. Our understanding of what works to eradicate all forms of modern slavery is limited and particularly so in crisis settings. It has never been a more urgent time to address this gap. This clear gap in knowledge led to Walk Free's partnership with UNHCR and the Global Protection Cluster and support for the development of the introductory guide on anti-trafficking action in internal displacement contexts. This guide assists practitioners in the detention, identification, referral, protection, and assistance of trafficked person. Measurement is a cornerstone of Walk Free's approach. Through this partnership, the GPC has begun reporting quarterly on trafficking risks and associated phenomena such as forced labor, forced recruitment, 
child and forced marriage, and the scale or exchange of sex in the 32 countries where the cluster mechanism is activated. Understanding the trafficking trends in crisis context is an important step in improving identification and supporting trafficking persons. And the role of technology is critical to counter modern slavery, facilitate cooperation, reach survivors, and to address their needs. Innovation in the anti-trafficking anti space is a two-edged sword. Technology is often referred to as a driver of and solution to tackling modern slavery. Tech can be used to recruit people into conditions of modern slavery. In fact, internal Facebook documents leaked in just the past few days revealed that Apple threatened to pull Facebook and Instagram from its app store over concerns the social media sites were being used to buy and sell domestic workers in the Middle East. The commodification of human beings being used on social media platforms that many of us have on our phones here today. Of course, Facebook promised a crackdown and Apple relented, but we know these platforms, along with many others, are still being used by unscrupulous recruiters. But tech can also be used to raise awareness and fight modern slavery. For example, the Global Freedom Network, which is Walk Free's faith-based arm, recently released the Faith for Freedom app, which is designed for and with faith leaders to help them identify and tackle modern slavery in their communities and congregations. It can also help our, our responses to modern slavery. Fair Supply, an Australian company that we at Walk Free are supporting, uses powerful mathematical algorithms to examine supply chains for risks of modern slavery. Given the increasingly complex complex, intricate geopolitical pressures, large scale displacement and continuing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has never been a more urgent time to have discussions such as this. We need to explore the opportunities to broaden our understanding of technological possibilities, raise awareness of concerns and discuss directly with survivors, activists, humanitarian actors and donors working in humanitarian crises. And we need to understand the limitations and dangers of using technology in conflict settings. There are some that believe technology is a silver bullet solution. Of course it is not, but where it can help advance our efforts, close gaps and bring movements closer together, it is critical we use it and understand it to the best of our ability. Thank you all for the opportunity to join you today for this timely discussion. I am looking forward to learning from you as we all raise awareness of existing tech tools and identify opportunities to use technology to combat modern slavery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you for, for this framing the topic for us. Thank you for the partnership, the commitment, uh, and the work that you do. I will be looking forward to, uh, to engage further with you when the questions start coming from the operations and get back to you. But now I would like to turn to, to you, Siobhan. Uh, from Greta to the special rapporteurship, uh, this is an issue that is not new. Uh, though technology as a term remains steady, the content of it keeps evolving at a high pace. Trafficking is ugly. Technology to combat trafficking. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it ugly? Help us frame how we should think about it. Over to you, Siobhan. Um, thank you very much, William. And thank you again to the Global Protection Cluster for this opportunity uh, to join this event and to engage with you on the work of my mandate as Special Rapporteur in Trafficking in Persons and to learn from you, um, from all of you in the field and at the front line of this situation. Um, trafficking in persons in conflict in humanitarian settings is a thematic priority for my mandate. And I've already spoken with um, William and others from the Global Protection Cluster team uh, to discuss how we can cooperate uh, to really better equip all those in conflict in humanitarian settings to identify victims of trafficking, to be proactive and ensure effective access to protection, and most importantly, to be more effective in our prevention actions. And I think here the role of technology is key. Um, as Grace said, and as William said, 
there are positive opportunities for us to be able to harness um, technologies, digital technologies for more inclusive environments and to reach a wider range of people to really prevent trafficking occurring in the first place. But digital technologies also pose very significant security challenges uh, and challenges in terms of the serious human rights violation of trafficking in persons. In my mandate uh, as Special Rapporteur in Trafficking in Persons, uh, we have been working with the potential of digital technologies to enhance protection mechanisms and to enhance prevention uh, operations in particular. Um, to give some examples, we've worked in the, in the labor exploitation context, in particular with vulnerable migrants um, and those who are forcibly displaced, who are often targeted by recruiters. So looking at the use of technologies to develop smartphone apps, for example, to empower workers in the workplace, and also to ensure that their voices are heard, um, monitoring what's happening in businesses, in workplaces, in agricultural settings, so that they themselves may become the key voices or the primary voices in monitoring and ensuring respect for labor rights. And here, I think this touches on um, a point that William mentioned, the importance of ensuring that survivors of trafficking, that their voices are heard and that they are taking a leadership role in defining how best to respond to the problem of trafficking in persons. That was a key theme um, for the World Day Against Trafficking in July this year. Um, and here I think we see that the use of digital technologies can ensure that survivors in different parts of the world can play this key role in early warning mechanisms, in monitoring human rights compliance and ensuring the dissemination of information uh, to prevent trafficking occurring in the first place. And while we know that digital technologies can be harnessed for the good, um, there are also, as I said, quite serious risks. Um, in my mandate and in the report that I'm presenting tomorrow uh, to the General Assembly, for example, I'm highlighting the nexus between trafficking and terrorism uh, and trafficking by terrorist extremist groups and other armed groups. And terrorist groups in particular make very good use of digital technologies to recruit children and adults online, particularly those who may be in vulnerable situations, in crisis settings, forcibly displaced, unaccompanied and separated children. Um, and we have seen this problem increasing in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, children being targeted for recruitment into armed groups, which as we know is a grave violation of international humanitarian law and international human, uh, human rights law. And, and that continues to occur in different parts of the world. Um, my mandate worked with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, made submissions on the, the recent general comment uh, on the rights of the child in the digital environment. And the general comment highlights the positive effects of digital technologies uh, in giving children uh, the opportunity to have their voices heard, children from different parts of the world in different settings. And importantly, I think here we also need to remember that digital technologies can play a critical role in ensuring disability inclusion in all anti-trafficking action. And that is particularly important in conflict settings and crisis settings where we know people with disabilities may face additional obstacles to being identified as at risk and in accessing uh, protection mechanisms. Uh, so this was something that was highlighted particularly um, in the, the engagement with the Committee on the Rights of the Child. And we've also engaged directly with the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, and highlighted the positive role that digital technologies can play in ensuring this inclusive environment. Um, but the, the problem of targeting of people who are in vulnerable situations in the online environment remains a, a serious concern, um, not only for purposes of sexual exploitation, but also forced labor, uh, child marriage, forced marriage, uh, and in, for the purposes of forced criminality. And here, I just want to highlight this because it's something that comes up again in my report tomorrow to the General Assembly, 
that victims of trafficking who are alleged to be associated with armed groups or terrorist groups who may have been trafficked for purposes of forced criminality are often punished and prosecuted rather than protected uh, and are not identified as such. Uh, and we see terrorist groups and armed groups using messaging platforms, uh, using online platforms to groom people in vulnerable situations, to recruit them initially, apparently for jobs, um, but then they end up in, in situations of sexual exploitation, forced marriage, forced labor. Uh, and while the use of voluntary codes of conduct um, by businesses uh, are useful, we really need to be looking uh, at more stringent ways of monitoring uh, and ensuring compliance by the big tech sector um, and by all businesses, including in their recruitment practices. Um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, has the BTEC project, which you may be familiar with. Um, and there, the Office of the High Commissioner provides resources on implementing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights in the technology space. And my mandate and other special procedures have met directly with tech companies to discuss how to be more effective in their prevention action in particular. And also then in ensuring access to remedies for victims, because that's where we often see very serious gaps. And I just want to highlight in particular the, the problem of the digital divide, the gender dimensions of the digital divide, which is a human rights concern in the context of crisis settings. Uh, and this has become even more obvious in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, where we see increased difficulties in accessing information, in accessing protection uh, for girl children in particular, uh, and for women, including in, in rural settings. The digital divide was something that was highlighted by the special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict in her recent report to the Security Council in March. Uh, and she highlighted again the problem and challenge of women and girls in conflict affected and displacement settings being harder to reach uh, and having less access to technologies because of restrictive social norms uh, and the gender-based digital divide uh, and the additional impact that that can have on the protection of their rights. So to conclude, I just want to note as well, the CEDAW, the, the general recommendation number 38 of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, um, which again looks at the role of the tech sector, the need for more effective action to protect uh, women in the context of international migration and girls, and the need for more proactive identification of the production of online sexual abuse material, particularly what we've seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the need for more effective action by technology companies and cooperation with uh, tech companies as well in terms of detecting online recruitment, identifying uh, the perpetrators and ensuring effective access to protection for victims. And all of these recommendations apply even more so in crisis settings. A crisis situation is a continuum of what we see happening in the everyday. So technology, digital technologies, like anything, can be used for the good, but it poses very significant challenges in terms of combating impunity uh, for trafficking, and traffickers know this. Um, so we see the exploitation of gaps in terms of international cooperation, jurisdiction, access to remedies, and effective communication to prevent trafficking in persons. But I think these are tools that we can use for the good, and through forums like this, we can ensure enhanced cooperation. I look forward to continued discussions. Thank you. Over to you, William. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Siobhan. Uh, and I'm looking forward at the end uh, of the session after you've listened to the to the to the whole uh, discussion as well to give us uh, towards the end a bit of marching orders to the cluster to the GPC of how do we build on today's session and what should we do in the next year uh, to help advance the thinking and the guidance uh, on this uh, on this important issue. Now I would like to to turn to Hannah Darnton. Uh, Hannah, uh, we have heard from from Siobhan and Grace. Uh, the gender dimension, the digital divide, the, uh, the, the steps of detecting, identifying, 
ensuring follow-up with survivors for access to remedies. And you have spent most of your career trying to align uh, business and the human rights. So tell us, how do we continue thinking about this topic? What are the measures that we need to take? And what have you learned through these years of engagement on, on topics like this? Over to you, Hannah. Great, thanks so much, William. And thank you all at the Global Protection Cluster for having me today. Really looking forward to diving further into this issue with you all. My name, as William said, is Hannah Darnton. I am an Associate Director of Ethics, Technology, and Human Rights here at Business for Social Responsibility, or BSR, in our San Francisco office. And as part of my role, I help lead the Tech Against Trafficking Coalition, which is what I'll be focusing on today. So I'll get into a little bit of an overview of tech against trafficking, some of the tools that we've identified, and then we'll move into some of the learnings from our work. So first off, tech against trafficking is a coalition of technology companies, including Amazon, BT or British Telecom, Microsoft and Salesforce that are collaborating with global experts such as yourselves to help eradicate human trafficking using technology. Launched in 2018, the goal of Tech Against Trafficking is to work with civil society, law enforcement, academia, and survivors to identify and support technology solutions that disrupt and reduce human trafficking, that prevent and identify crimes, and that provide remedy mechanisms for victims and survivors. And by tapping into their expertise, their capacity for innovation, their global reach, our member companies believe that the tech industry can really provide the opportunity to accelerate solutions tackling modern slavery. Slide. Great, so following our launch in 2018, our first step as a coalition was to map the landscape of existing technology tools being used to combat human trafficking. We then identified the technology tools with the potential for scale or interest in exploring new innovative partnerships geared towards greater impact through the use of technology. And really to help create a comprehensive, constantly updated map of the list of anti-trafficking technology tools that currently exist in different geographies and different languages with varied target populations. Then through our technology accelerator program, we continue to support those identified tools, those organizations leveraging technology for more effective use and deployment to really advance and scale their work while simultaneously trying to create the connective tissue that brings together organizations and technology tools operating across the anti-trafficking sector and help lead them to systems level change. Slide. So throughout this process and over the course of our landscape mapping, we actually identified more than 300 anti-trafficking tools used across a wide range of geographies, target users, and focus areas. And here that you can see on the slide that more than a quarter of the tools are victim or trafficker identification tools. Over 24% of the tools focused on supply chain management or corporate risk identification. And many of them did the exact same thing, just slightly differently or in slightly different geographies. So lots of duplication, lots of replication, and a lot of funding going to recreating the same tool over and over again. Next slide. Now, these tools were really present in a range of different geographies, but we mainly saw them popping up in North America, in Asia, and in Europe. And to this day, we're not quite sure if that's because that's what we were able to access and see. Those were in languages more accessible to the team doing the research, or if there's actually fewer digital technologies being used in areas such as Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Oceania. And we're continuing to explore this, continuing to map today, but this is a little bit of the trend we're seeing here, is the tools being created in these specific countries I mentioned, but then used for deployment in other geographies, which of course creates an inherent unbalance. You know, if there's a tool being created in the United States that's then used in Latin America, there's a lot of cultural uh, dissonance or boundaries that they haven't necessarily explored when they're being used on the ground in different countries. And let's go to the next slide. 
These tools ranged from simple mobile apps informing vulnerable communities and individuals of the risk of labor or labor exploitation to more advanced technologies, such as satellite imagery and geospatial mapping tools being used to track down fishing vessels engaged in illegal activity. We also identified tools using facial recognition, using blockchain or big data analysis and visualization. But really, there was a huge spread in the different types of technologies being deployed. And actually, that's the end of the slide. So happy to go off the slides for a moment and just speak to some of the learnings. What we saw here was that even with all of these technology tools, which purportedly can help bring us together and create communications and networking across these different geographies, across different types of actors, the anti-trafficking ecosystem still remains largely siloed. And I'm sure this is something that much of many of you see in your day-to-day -day practice as well. The collaboration and engagement between the organizations deploying these technologies has really been minimal. And efforts, as I mentioned earlier, are often duplicated. Opportunities for new solutions are missed due to a lack of information about similar initiatives or a lack of shared or compatible data. And the nominal technical infrastructure and expertise as well as a dearth of sustained funding and support. So as an example, our landscape mapping identified approximately 70 unique technology tools developed for the purpose of victim or trafficker identification. With better systems to share information, share best practices, learnings, and communicate across different areas, across different types of actors, we could have used a similar tool in each of these geographies learned from the deployment in one area to help convert it or lift and shift it to a new area where we could just repurpose it rather than spending all that time funding resource relearning how to develop a tool for specific settings so technology as we've mentioned before has a huge opportunity here it really can help advance and scale our work in the anti-trafficking sector but the ways in which these technologies can be misused and abused, as uh, Shvam was mentioning earlier, is something that we have to really consider and do our due diligence on as we consider how to use them at scale. And so for the final part of this presentation, what I'd like to do is just highlight six key considerations that we need to keep in mind as we think through the role of technology across the anti-trafficking sector. And I've been a little bit of a broken record on a few of these issues, so please forgive me if you've heard these before. But the first is that as we consider how to deploy technologies, we need to provide ongoing technical support. So technology often acts as a multiplier effect in terms of organizational impact. But many of the civil society organizations developing or deploying these tools have limited capacity, resources, and personnel, which creates barriers and challenges to taking on and maintaining effective technology and scaling it. Organizations deploying any and all forms of technology will need support in the form of capacity building, maintenance, and long-term staffing and technical support within their organizations, as well as a reevaluation of how we fund these actual technologies for deployment and making sure that we're providing that overhead or administrative costs that prevent investments and funding of technology or they have prevented it in the past. As a second item, we really need active engagement and participation from those closest to the issue, those working on the ground and helping to tackle this, this crime. So those who are funding, developing, implementing and deploying the technology-based solutions need to ensure the active engagement and participation of the vulnerable population or target group throughout the design, development, and deployment of technology solutions. And this means even as, for example, a case manager within a social, social service provider, bringing in those beneficiaries of your programs, making sure that as you're capturing data, as you're making sure that you're, you know, being able to track movement of an individual from one service to another, that you're speaking to them about the potential risks of those technologies, how this could be better used and help serve those beneficiaries to a greater extent. Survivors of trafficking and victims of trafficking are ultimately the beneficiaries of all interventions in this field, and they play a very important role in the development of the tools designed to end human trafficking and to help provide support to the, the phenomenon. As a third, 
would like to talk about fit for purpose. So this plays into the importance of addressing and understanding the various stakeholder groups needs before developing a technology solution for them. So again, those that are funding, developing, deploying and implementing technology based solutions should ensure that solutions are fit for purpose, taking into account issues regarding access, coverage, literacy, organizational resources and technical infrastructure prior to deploying a solution. One of the solutions that I was looking at that really was monitoring migration over the US-Mexico border had this beautiful design. You know, the app was really fantastic and it looked like it would be absolutely wonderful when rolled out. But they hadn't actually consulted stakeholders. They hadn't considered the actual connectivity for the app in that geography. And so it never actually really worked. They weren't able to get people to download it onto their phones because nobody had a smartphone. The language wasn't a real great fit with the populations they were targeting. And then, of course, the lack of connectivity meant no one could use it in the first place. So what would have been better in that situation? How can you make that technology fit for purpose in that scenario? Many practitioners that we've spoken to have highlighted that organizations looking for technology-based solutions are not always clear about the specific problems they hope to solve. And there's a risk that technology will be seen as the solution itself rather than a means to solve the problem. Furthermore, we really wanna make sure that we understand and conduct due diligence to see if the solution already exists. Resources should not be spent duplicating work where remedies already exist. And instead, we can seek to share relevant data and technologies, increase collaboration, and aim to innovate on the work solving problems uh, when there's no efficient tool in existence already. And just a few more here before I wind things up. So fourth is that there are limits to what technology can do. And I think a lot of you realize that already, but many people I speak to always think that technology is going to be the silver bullet. And technology cannot act as a substitute for the range of other factors needed to effectively combat trafficking, such as political will, adequate resources, or a commitment from a wide range of actors with the mandate and competencies in this field to really help tackle the problem. The human trafficking value chain, if we can call you that, needs to be addressed at multiple points, requiring significant collaborations across sectors. And then fifth, consider the easy solutions. So a range of technology solutions are needed in this space from those big AI solutions, so satellite solutions to WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, dedicated SMS text phone channels that allow multiple avenues of communication with a victim when they're seeking assistance. Messaging apps can provide a straightforward way for victims to communicate in real time with service providers or personnel, personal support networks and capturing data in the same way so that we're actually able to standardize information collected. And this is a big one, is how do we actually create systems that capture information so we can track trends across different geographies, make sure that we're speaking in the same language. And as I say all of this, I would very much agree with the UN Special Rapporteur that despite the positive uses of all these technologies, we really need to be conducting our due diligence on the technologies themselves. And I think this is one of my most important points here is that the provision of such technologies must be accompanied with training, not only on the direct use of the tools, but their ethical use with the respect of human rights and data protection. Due diligence has to be conducted on technologies deployed by government, law enforcement, and service providers, and the technology developers, the larger tech companies developing these different tech tools to identify, avoid, address and mitigate all potential adverse human rights impacts that may arise from the use of technology in accordance with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And if you take a look at the report produced earlier this year, or actually now it's last year, what is time anymore, but by Tech Against Trafficking and OSCE, our report really speaks to the potential for both international, or sorry, both intentional and unintentional misuse of technology. And we're urging all partners across the life cycle of technology, but especially those closest to the ground using these technologies that can help identify issues to undertake due diligence on these products to ensure that the appropriate protections and mitigation measures are put in place. And that's where I'll stop today, but happy to answer any questions as we go on with the discussion. Hannah, thank you so much. Um, and one on the content and uh, and the, the considerations it's very useful to have this structuring of what we should look uh, into but i think also your mapping 
uh, is a uh, is a is a factual reason why we're having this session. The numbers that you have shown shows that this is a space that exists, like it or not. It's there. It has taken off, and we got to engage in it. I would like to turn next to Myron. Uh, but before that, encourage uh, all the participants to start raising their hands or writing uh, questions in the chat box. Because uh, after Myelin speaks, I will uh, start turning to uh, to interventions from uh, uh, from you guys. Myelin, um, you work every day. Muchas gracias. You work every day uh, on combating trafficking the simple, exhausting, physical, personal, tracking, identification, saving, protection, and accompanying girls and boys uh, that, that have been trafficked or at risk of trafficking. We have heard uh, from, uh, uh, from the speakers so far that uh, some of the existing technologies like social media are used to target uh, and to uh, uh, to uh, to recruit, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, victims to be trafficked. We have also heard that organizations are using technological tools, either simple ones or customized, to share information, to record, to track, to identify. These two things exist. Does any of this resonate? with your daily work? What do you think about it? Is technology useful for you on day-to-day -day basis or is it increasing the risk? Over to you, Maya. Muchas gracias, William. Buenos días. Eh, buenas tardes a todas y a todos. Eh, desde la Fundación Renacer valoramos eh, el hecho de que se ponga este tema en la agenda, en este foro tan importante. Eh, a nivel mundial. Eh, desafortunadamente, eh, la pandemia ha traído un impacto no solamente pues, en lo que ya todos conocemos y sabemos, sino que eh, también ha puesto eh, más cerca a los niños y a las niñas de las tecnologías de la Internet y con ello se ha aumentado el riesgo, el riesgo del abuso, de la explotación sexual y de la trata de personas eh, con fines de explotación sexual o con cualquiera otro de los otros fines. Eh, a diario, como le decía William, estamos trabajando con los niños y con las niñas, con los adolescentes, con las mujeres sobrevivientes también, en, en los hogares de atención, pero también trabajamos en las comunidades y en las instituciones educativas. Y encontramos, por un lado, jóvenes usando las tecnologías de información y comunicación para prevenir la explotación sexual, utilizando videos, utilizando todas las herramientas que los jóvenes, los niños y las niñas conocen. Han hecho foros virtuales ahorita durante la pandemia y ha sido eh, de verdad importantísimo ver a los jóvenes compartir en la región de Latinoamérica, por ejemplo, eh, nuevas ideas y nuevas estrategias para prevenir la explotación sexual comercial de niños, niñas y adolescentes. Pero por otro lado tenemos el otro grupo de niñas y de niños que siguen siendo contactados a través de las redes sociales, incluso a través de los videojuegos, siendo estos escenarios propicios para que los abusadores y los explotadores ingresen o contacten a los niños y a las niñas. También encontramos, por ejemplo, eh, cómo mujeres, eh, y esto está asociado al flujo migratorio, cómo mujeres de otros países son contactadas y traídas hasta el territorio de Colombia para ser explotadas sexualmente acá. Y esto lo hacen a través, vía WhatsApp, vía Facebook, eh, en donde los tratantes las contactan, envían la foto de las chicas y, y los tratantes eh, las aprueban como si fuese una mercancía. Entonces, y esto se ha visto profundizado ahorita en estos dos últimos años. Encontramos, por ejemplo, en los establecimientos de prostitución que durante la pandemia estuvieron cerrados, pues por lo menos eh, los primeros seis meses estuvieron cerrados, eh, estuvieron cerrados para el público, pero eh, seguían contactando a las chicas, a, crearon, se reinventaron también 
Así como el comercio se reinventó y nosotros desde las instituciones nos reinventamos, los tratantes, los explotadores sexuales y en este caso los establecimientos de prostitución también se reinventaron, entonces también abrieron páginas y también contactaban a las chicas y a los chicos a través de redes sociales y, y se daban, digamos, los encuentros en físico. Entonces, eh, creemos que, que esto ha tenido un crecimiento alarmante durante la pandemia, es necesario es necesario, eh, como lo decían mis antecesoras, eh, generar una estrategia intersectorial para poder eh, generar una prevención, no solamente desde el entorno digital, sino que esa prevención tiene que estar en fusión con el entorno físico. Es decir, así como se crean estrategias de prevención en donde deben participar las empresas, las familias y el gobierno y la sociedad, también de esa misma manera se debe hacer la prevención en el entorno físico. Eh, por otro lado, consideramos necesario la colaboración entre países. En Colombia tu, hemos tenido varios casos de colaboración entre países y, y saco a colación uno en donde un explotador sexual explotaba a niños y a niñas iniciando acá en Colombia, en la costa caribe colombiana, y se fue extendiendo y al cabo de unos años ya contactaba niños en Latinoamérica y es en Argentina donde es identificado y aquí el gobierno de Argentina en colaboración con el gobierno colombiano logran dar captura a, a este delincuente que tenía más de 200 víctimas eh, en, su, en sus redes, en, en todas su, 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 sus páginas de internet y de todas esas más de 200 víctimas solamente logramos ubicar dos en físico en la costa caribe colombiana, pero con esas dos víctimas se logró eh, que, que el testimonio de ellos fuese importante y contribuyera para la judicialización de este agresor. Por otro lado, consideramos importante eh, darle la vuelta, así como, como, como entiendo que este foro está logrando y es darle la vuelta y cómo empezamos a fortalecer el uso de las tecnologías de la información y de la comunicación para la prevención y también para la denuncia. Entonces, eh, son, las cifras son alarmantes. Hanna nos compartió unas cifras. Yo quiero compartir unas también de WIPROTEP en un documento que sacó de la evaluación de la amenaza global de 2021. Dice, en el 2020 se intercambiaron 1.038.268 archivos de multimedia individual a través de la plataforma de clasificación y recopilación de material sobre abuso sexual infantil. Y en mayo de 2021, la Europol desmanteló una página web de abuso sexual infantil de la Dark Web con más de 400 mil suscriptores. Y hay más de 3 millones de cuentas registradas en las 10 páginas más dañinas sobre abuso sexual infantil en la Dark Web. Entonces, son cifras alarmantes que en donde decimos esto nos está sobrepasando a nuestra capacidad de respuesta. Eh, quiero terminar diciéndoles que el impacto del abuso, de la explotación sexual y de la trata de personas en la vida de los niños y de las niñas atraviesa todo su ser y así como es necesaria la prevención, también es necesario que sigamos atendiendo y acompañando a las sobrevivientes y a los sobrevivientes en su proceso de recuperación emocional, pero por sobre todas las cosas creo importante que las familias, los cuidadores, los educadores y educadoras aprendamos un poco más sobre tecnología para estar al nivel de los niños, de las niñas y de los adolescentes y poder hacer un acompañamiento un poco más efectivo en, para prevenir esta práctica delictiva tan dañina como es la trata de personas con fines de explotación sexual y el abuso sexual. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Maya. I think you echoed uh, a bit what the first three speakers said as there is no silver bullet, but also you summed up Uh, I think you, you said it in a, in a very elegant way that the technical, uh, technological environment needs to be in touch with the physical environment for it to work. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a good summary also of what, uh, what Hannah, uh, Grace and, uh, and Siobhan uh, have said. So thank you so much. I will be getting uh, back to you. Now I have a number of uh, interventions uh, from operations. Um, I have five uh, uh, recorded, 
uh, I uh, encourage uh, new questions also to be written in the chat box and we will pick up on them. So we will listen first to Lazar uh, from Burundi, then followed by Jean uh, from Burkina, then by FNO HD from Centre Afrique, uh, Melania Rosita, uh, and then uh, finally from Isidor. So this will be the first round of interventions from the, uh, from the field. Uh, and then uh, we will go to the, uh, to the panelists after. So Lazar uh, from Burundi, uh, you work like Maya uh, in very concrete way on combating trafficking uh, with children, with girls, with boys. Um, and I'm very curious to, to hear from you as we've heard from Maya Lane. Is that topic that we're discussing today real? Does the, uh, the information and the opinion and the guidance that we heard from the panelists, does it resonate with you? Does it make sense on day-to-day -day basis? Lazar, uh, at work. Ok, grand merci. Je m'appelle Lazar Nyongou, je suis du Burundi. Je travaille dans une ONG Action avec femmes et enfants vulnérables. Comme vous le dites, nous sommes toujours au service pour réellement résoudre ou donner réponse aux, aux problèmes des survivants des VBG. Je félicite vous réellement Global Protection qui a fait à ce que réellement ce, ce panel puisse avoir lieu. Pour moi, comme vous le dites, nous sommes toujours à l'œuvre de trouver les réponses aux survivants de la traite. Et comme les gens qui ont été venus avant, réellement, la traite, vous connaissez bel et bien, c'est une exploitation, c'est une sorte d'esclavage. Et si j'entre je, directement au niveau de de la technologie. Oui, la technologie est un grand allié, comme les autres ont dit, parce que ça nous aide également dans la prévention, dans l'assistance, dans le plaidoyer et même, je dirais, dans la réintégration. Les outils de la technologie, réellement, ils sont très efficaces parce que vous savez bel et bien, avec la coordination, avec la communication, on utilise toujours les outils technologiques. En témoigne, si je dis pour le Burundi, il y a deux sortes de la traite. Il y a la traite externe, il y a également la, la traite interne. Au niveau de la traite externe, nous avons pu avoir écho que cette euh, traite externe existe à partir des outils, des outils technologiques. Les gens qui sont allés clandestinement en, en, en en Arabie Saoudite, en Oman, en Koweït, les Anglais, nous avons su réellement à cause des outils technologiques. Ils ont été rapatriés, ils ont été retournés au Burundi grâce aux outils technologiques. Arrivés ici, nous avons bien sûr dans plein d'enregistrements, en plein d'identification dans le cadre des données, de bases de données, mais également à ce moment, nous utilisons bien sûr des outils technologiques. À ce qui concerne la le plan d'assistance socio-économique, nous utilisons toujours des outils technologiques. Si nous devons nous rendre réellement euh, ou bien avoir des enregistrements à, à distance, nous utilisons bien sûr les WhatsApp, nous utilisons les emails, nous utilisons tout ça. Donc, nous avons également des lignes à, pour réellement à, au niveau de WhatsApp, des lignes, de, une, une ligne qui a un questionnaire de référencement et grâce à cela, nous parvenons bien sûr à faire identification, mais vraiment enregistrement et donner réponse dans un temps minimum et efficace. Donc, pour moi, réellement, comme les autres vous ont dit, je dis absolument euh, vrai que réellement, les outils technologiques ont un impact très considérable au niveau de prévention, assistance, plaidoyer, mais également au niveau de la réintégration socio-économique. 
si je peux avoir encore du temps, je voudrais également dire que ici au Burundi, le cas de la le cas de, de traite sont réellement très beaucoup, très nombreux, euh, mais également nous disons que les, les, les problèmes qu'on bien les défis qu'on fait face, c'est que malgré réellement cette importance des outils technologiques, la plupart des fois n'ont pas ces outils technologiques de la technologie, n'ont pas de, de moyens pour acheter le WhatsApp, n'ont pas de moyens pour acheter les ordinateurs, n'ont pas de moyens pour réellement aller aux Internet à cause de la connexion. Donc, ce sont des défis, mais nous constatons bien sûr que ces outils technologiques qui sont réellement les meilleures solutions pour faire des services adéquats et d'une façon efficace et efficiente dans un minimum de temps. Donc, pour moi, c'est une grande joie réellement de voir si réellement Thanks. on peut réellement encourager à ce que les associations aient dans le sens, dans le but de la lutte contre la traite, mais également la lutte contre les VBG, parce que c'est lien entre les deux, entre les VBG et les traite, il y a toujours des liens. Euh, je dirais réellement que il, ça serait très bonne chose de voir comment l'autre a dit, de voir comment le sait, comment faire tout ce qui est possible de, afin que, bien sûr, les acteurs ou les parties prenantes puissent être dotés de ces outils technologiques pour réellement porter ces cours, mais également rendre Thanks. des services. Merci, merci bien, Lazare. Thank you uh, so much and thank you for bringing that, that notion of, of tech divide and gender uh, divide and accessing tech that, uh, that Yvonne Uh, has has raised uh, uh, initially. I would like to turn to uh, Jean Olenga. Uh, Jean, vous êtes au Burkina. You are in Burkina, uh, uh, and uh, it would be great to to hear from you uh, a specific question or your experience in this issue. Uh, à vous, Jean. Euh, merci beaucoup, William. Je m'appelle Jean. Je suis au Burkina. Je travaille pour le compte de Oxfam. Euh, bon, ce n'est pas une question spécifique. L'expérience soulevée va faire mention de tout ce qu'on vit actuellement avec euh, la cybercriminalité pour pouvoir arriver à lutter ou à contribuer efficacement à lutter contre la traite des êtres humains ou toute forme d'exploitation ou d'esclavagisme. Donc, je voudrais, euh, au cours de ce forum, que les échanges soient beaucoup plus approfondis pour voir quelles sont les dispositions efficaces et les mesures les plus adaptées qui nous permettent, nous, en tant que structure qui opérons sur le terrain, à pouvoir développer des mécanismes efficaces en lien avec la technologie actuellement développée dans le cadre des mécanismes qui lutteront contre la traite des êtres humains. Comment nous pouvons faire face à cette question de la cybercriminalité. Parce que plus la technologie elle est développée, plus la cybercriminalité, la cybercriminalité elle est aussi développée. Est-ce que le mécanisme à ce jour est plus fort ou pas Donc, ce sont les débats sur lesquels je voudrais avoir plus d'éléments parce que sur la base des expériences terrain, ça veut dire qu'il y a beaucoup de mécanismes déjà développés mais est-ce que c'est efficace? Est-ce que c'est opérationnel? Est-ce que c'est efficient? Voilà ma contribution. Thank you, Jean. Merci beaucoup, Jean. Uh, for the direct question, I think we will demand a direct answer from uh, from our uh, our panelists. But before that, let me turn to uh, to Centrafrique. F N O D H uh, F N O H T Uh, Centrafrique, vous aviez une question, uh, you had a question, uh, it would be great to, uh, to hear from you directly. Go ahead. Oui, bon, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, je pense que sur la question, ah, ça, ça va bien encore. Oui, je, 
Je pense que pour la question de traite des personnes euh, et sur l'utilisation de la technologie, euh, de notre côté, nous pensons que ce n'est pas euh, la technologie en elle-même qui, qui pose problème, c'est beaucoup plus des questions liées à la mentalité et à l'usage de la technologie. Et je pense que l'outil qui serait développé euh, doit, doit tenir compte de, de l'intensification de, de la sensibilisation des utilisateurs qui, qui utilisent cette technologie-là pour nuire à la, à, 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 euh, aux communautés. Et, et je pense aussi bien qu'on euh, pourrait aussi trouver aussi euh, des terrains d'entente avec euh, les géants technologiques qui pourront bien évidemment nous aider dans ce sens-là pour pouvoir réduire euh, euh, les risques, les risques de, 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 hein, de, de traite des personnes et parce que c'est eux qui contrôlent tout le système mondial, les réseaux sociaux et bien d'autres choses. Et donc, leur contribution vraiment sera très, très importante dans ces, dans ces discussions pour pouvoir trouver des solutions adéquates pour euh, euh, gérer ces, ces problèmes de, de la technologie. Je vous remercie. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I see also, thank you for the, for the clear question. I see also uh, a question from uh, Melania, Roswitha, uh, and Isador uh, that are clear. Uh, and then Christina, thank you for your question uh, on the leadership and management structures of the tech companies. I will take one last question from uh, Amadou, uh, who has uh, his hand up. Uh, and then I will, uh, I will start turning back to our panelists to start addressing some of the issues. Amadou, to you. Amadou, did you have any uh, question? Can you hear us? Yes, uh, thank you for sharing and for uh, response. I have one question. What is the good technology now to use for uh, to avoid the, the threat of human threat in the Mali uh, by the, the public, the, the population is not uh, too rich, it's a poor population. Is this possible to use a small technology who not uh, not very expensive for the population using. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Amadou. Uh, please, for the, for the rest, including Leonard, uh, please do put your question uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the chat box and we will take it accordingly. So let me turn back to the, uh, to the panelists. I think it's it's very interesting to uh, uh, to see a bit the uh, the tension where you have gone systematically through your presentation uh, saying that there is no silver bullet there is no straightforward answer there is no uh, uh, clear platform uh, to talk about and then the majority of the questions that come from the field operations is, you know, what should we do? Give us a clear, straight answer. What platform should we use? Uh, do we use this? Yes or no? Um, so I think there is an inherent uh, uh, tension there that I would like in, in several ways to, to, to dismantle uh, part of it uh, with you today. So I would like first uh, uh, to turn to uh, to you, Grace, and say, uh, from all what you have heard, what do you think is the exact role of the big companies? Uh, we have seen uh, uh, questions related to that uh, resonating in two, three questions, actually. For the big companies, what can we do concretely with them? What is their role and responsibility uh, in a very concrete way? Grace, over to you. 
thank you, William. And I think I'd first like to apologise to everyone for my video. I'm having some severe tech issues. It wouldn't be a COVID conference without at least one of us doing that. So I'm glad to take one for the team. Um, I think really this comes down to radical transparency and for the big companies without that, that's the bedrock upon which all other change can be built. We know that only 6% of global supply chains have transparency across them. And it's just completely unacceptable. We know that forced labor and human trafficking is occurring throughout our global economy through distress migration, through informal migration pathways on an unprecedented level. As I said earlier, um, in regards to the Facebook leaks um, from just the last few days, you know, I don't think anyone's under any illusion that Facebook is an ethical actor, but I know from my work in the conflict mediation space, working with the Centre for Humanitarian Dialogue, that there are many funders coming into this space now who are yet to clean up their own acts. And I think if we look at, you know, it's kind of like Coca-Cola funding a campaign for diabetes, we've got to look for the fox in the hen house. And unless we can have these companies retrospectively look back and clean up their own acts and address severe gaps within their own supply chains and within their own policies, um, then we certainly shouldn't be letting them into these intricate spaces where survivors are vulnerable and the stakes are just way too high. And another social media platform that I didn't mention in my opening remarks was TikTok, which is obviously probably the most popular one at the moment for young people. And we've literally seen human trafficking rings occur on there for children, for domestic workers, um, giving the size and dimensions of people and what their skills are. Um, and it's seriously disturbing because it's set to music and it trends in to children's and young people's feeds, but that's not by mistake. It's because it is so insidious in our global economy. So I think that um, that radical transparency, that ability for us as a coalition to say, we don't want your dirty money if you're not going to clean up your own acts. And the reality is this, this space for all of us, there needs to be a far greater investment into these fields more broadly, but we need that investment to not be doing harm while also be trying to do good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Grace. Let me turn to you, Hannah. You have spoken in your presentation mostly about technologies used to combat trafficking. Uh, I would like to look at the at the at the at the other flip side and and the questions that are coming from uh, from two operations at least saying, how can we face actually cyber criminality on technologies that that do exist and not specific tools designed to combat uh, trafficking, but spaces that do exist. Any, um, any trends, any ideas, any pushes in addition to what, uh, what Siobhan has, uh, has mentioned earlier in her interventions? Over to you, Hannah. Yes, I'd say taking off my tech against trafficking hat for a moment. So my main role here at Business for Social Responsibility is actually working with our 300 company members to integrate ethics and human rights based approaches to their work. And I think that's where I would really land on is that companies have a responsibility under the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to respect and protect human rights and to address the human rights impacts that they're associated with. And I think that that's where companies need to start. They need to start by identifying those adverse human rights impacts associated with their products, their services, and their platforms. And we can look just at human trafficking, but I think we should also look at the wider range of human rights impacts. So many different human rights, you know, the freedom of expression, the um, risk of forced labor and trafficking, um, you know, ability to access culture, right to scientific advancement. So many of these are intertwined. So companies that need to take a step back and look at all human rights, their connection to all of them, and then figure how, how to address each of those impacts that they're connected to. And so I think that'd be my starting place is making sure that they actually have the mechanisms, the structures, the processes in place to systematically review the negative impacts they're associated with and address them. And part of what the UN Guiding Principle states is that they need to not only identify and address, but they need to track and communicate. So making sure that they are actually tracking how effective and 
efficient their responses are, and then being transparent in how they are responding to those items. The two additional things I'd add there is that, you know, what we don't talk about in the UN guiding principles is the opportunity to promote human rights. And so I think companies need to make sure that they're looking at how to address the negative impacts, but also thinking about how to leverage their in-house resources, their skills to further tackle the issue as collaborative. And I almost see it as kind of two different sides of the coin, you know, as addressing the supply chains that Grace was looking at earlier, really being introspective, taking a look at those negative impacts, and then thinking through as an industry or collaboration of how we can further tackle and proactively address the issue outside of your own four walls. The one thing I would mention is that we talk a lot about technology companies too, but now there's so many actors deploying these technologies. You know, many of the groups that sit here in Silicon Valley create platforms and services for companies not within the tech sector. And so how do we make sure that we're bringing others into that conversation as well and ensuring the responsibility of actors throughout the tech ecosystem, those using the technologies, those deploying it, those putting ads on it, those, you know, how are we bringing them in to make sure that they're looking at their impacts as well and that they have responsibility to help protect and respect human rights alongside the technology companies developing these, these tools. Thanks, Hannah. Maya, um, give us a concrete example of a concrete tech tool that you use that you find reliable and it works and tell us how do you actually use it? Gracias, Miriam. Eh, antes de responder tu pregunta, yo quiero, eh, digamos, sumar un poco a lo que venía diciendo Hanna con respecto a, a las empresas en general y derechos humanos. Creo que el problema de trata de personas en general y de la explotación sexual comercial de niños, niñas, adolescentes se da en diversos escenarios. Se da en el escenario físico, en, en la comunidad, en la familia en las instituciones educativas, en los flujos migratorios. También se da en el sector turístico. También se da en el sector minero energético. Y también se da en el sector de las telecomunicaciones. En ese sentido, hay unas experiencias en Colombia y a nivel mundial en lo que tiene que ver con el sector turístico. Y cómo las empresas turísticas se han unido y han luchado contra la explotación sexual comercial y contra la trata de personas y se han adherido a códigos de ética, a códigos de conducta que con unos puntos específicos, así como cumplir con una certificación y con TED, una certificación ISO, eh, que no es solamente firmar un papel y tomarse la foto, sino que el hotel, la agencia de viaje, la aerolínea debe ser responsable en la protección de los niños y adolescentes y en la prevención de la trata de personas y la explotación sexual comercial. Creo yo que ese es un camino y, y es una ruta a seguir en lo que tiene que ver con las empresas tecnológicas. Creo que las empresas tecnológicas de información y comunicación, las grandes, las medianas y las pequeñas, deben también asumir esos códigos de ética, esos códigos de conducta eh, que algunos son asumidos como no vinculantes, no en una norma o en una ley vigente en el país y en otros países sí está como ley. Por ejemplo, aquí en Colombia, Todas las empresas turísticas deben asumir códigos de conducta por ley para prevenir la explotación sexual comercial. Creería, y, y es como una de las propuestas que hago acá y que pongo a consideración, y es que con las, así como se hace con el sector turístico, también se haga con las empresas de telecomunicaciones, de información y comunicación, y que haya un compromiso real y serio en la prevención de la explotación sexual comercial, de la trata de personas con fines Eh, con cualquiera de las finalidades que se da la trata de personas porque estamos ante un delito y ante una vulneración a los derechos humanos. Entonces no se puede negociar con eso, no se puede poner de primero el dinero, las utilidades o las ganancias a los derechos humanos de, de, de mujeres, de hombres, de niños, niñas y adolescentes. Ese sería como mi primer aporte a, a la discusión. El segundo... Me preguntabas que si hemos utilizado alguna herramienta, pues ahora en la pandemia eh, todas estas herramientas de Zoom, todas estas herramientas de Meet han sido de gran utilidad. Les contaba que los jóvenes han logrado unirse en Latinoamérica a una voz 
y proponer ellos, jóvenes, estoy hablando desde los 14 añitos hasta los 25 años, jóvenes dialogando permanentemente eh, y nosotros los adultos aprendiendo de ellos porque otra cosa que, que dije en mi exposición y es que nosotros los adultos tenemos que aprender porque es que nosotros no sabemos, muchos de nosotros no sabemos todo lo que saben los niños, niñas y adolescentes. Entonces, para poder hacer esa prevención de la que hablaba en medio físico, nosotros los adultos y las adultas tenemos que saber, tenemos que conocer. Eh, hay un sinnúmero de redes sociales y creo que nosotros solo conocemos WhatsApp, Facebook. Hay un sinnúmero que es necesario que nosotros conozcamos, que los profesores y las profesoras conozcan y que en ese sentido podamos ir en sinergia también caminando al lado de los chicos y de las chicas. Muchísimas gracias. Yes, we, yeah, we have to learn from, from our children and young people. I fully, uh, fully agree. I want to give the floor to, uh, to Jennifer Chase to to tell us what's her main takeaways from the whole session, then give the last word uh, to Siobhan. But before, before that, before closing remarks, uh, if we can remove the slide, I'm so intrigued to, to turn back to you, uh, Grace, and uh, pick one specific question that came. Uh, big companies have male dominated Uh, management structures. How does that have an impact in terms of uh, uh, in terms of human rights alignments and this specific case trafficking? Any thoughts about that? I've heard you previously speaking with passion <laughs> about this issue, and I'm very intrigued to ask you this question. Over to you. <laughs> well. I wish I had my camera on so you could see my face when you asked that question. It's a great one. Um, I think, you know, I'd preface what I was about to say by we all know that doing the same thing and expecting a different system that has got us to where we are, the system that's got us to the fact there are more people living in modern slavery than at previous times in historical slavery that underpins our global economy. Um, these things aren't mistakes. They have happened purposefully. And I think that um, human trafficking, modern slavery, the many terms we use under that umbrella, um, we know these are highly gendered problems. We know that conservatively, one in every 130 women and girls on earth is living in some form of modern slavery. And I say conservatively because that number is taken from the last global estimates of modern slavery created between Walk Free, the ILO and the IOM pre-COVID-19. So the minimum amount of women and girls living in modern slavery is one in every 130. And This could literally be as close as the shirt on our back, the coffee we drank this morning, the technology we speak on today. 71% of all victims of modern slavery are women and girls, and I think that these problems cannot be solved by the patriarchal structures that at best have allowed them to occur or have ignored it from being their responsibility or at worst have benefited from it directly. Here, here. Thank you so much, uh, Grace. Uh, Thank you. Jennifer, you are the lead of the gender-based violence area of responsibility globally. You have been listening to this conversation and you've got five minutes to wrap it all up for us. Over to you, Jen. Um, so I really want to thank all of the speakers. I think it's been a fascinating session. Um, it's been a great great combination of hearing from special repertoire, hearing from, I mean, how exciting to hear about human rights within the tech companies. You know, I, I, I hope there's a lot more of you, Hannah, out there, um, because I think that's a really important bridge to have between, you know, protection, human rights, and, and then looking at, um, The, the, the tech companies and the responsibilities and the accountabilities and not just um, the accountability of the companies themselves, but those who are using the platforms, you know, hearing about those who are placing the ads 
uh, here learning about supply chains and, and what a low rate of transparency that there is. Um, and I think this is something we all need to impact. And I also really appreciated the point of um, broadening our perspective on, on human rights, you know, that, that we're, we're looking at the bigger issues of, of the digital divide that includes um, lack of access um, and, uh, and, and, and not just, you know, just sort of so many dimensions that need to be worked on in a, in a comprehensive um, way. And um, and thank you so much for the rich field experiences. And I, I really sort of resonated with that question. I think coming from Mali of you know what what are the what what about those of us who who don't have a lot of funding and resources um, to deal with these issues? And I think we did hear about that a lot can be done with SMS and with um, uh, WhatsApp. And you know, in terms of identification, but also in terms of providing services, linking people to services. You know, I think we heard the example of the the sophisticated tool that was created for the border between Mexico and the U.S., but then people didn't think about languages or about access to internet, or you know. So, so I think you know, going back to, to the basics uh, is also, and I and I appreciated Marilyn's also reminder to all of us about. Um, the need for the, the physical space still, you know, we still need the, peop the, the people on the ground who, who are accompanying survivors who are responding. And, and I, um, I appreciated hearing about integration because I know that's a really challenging issue. Once people have been identified, helping them integrate, reintegrate back into their communities, back within their families, I know that's a big issue. And so it's good to hear that technology is helping with that as well. So I think really, um, at least for me, this has opened, uh, sort of raised a lot of new questions for me. <laughs> Instead of making me feel like I have more clarity, I feel like I have a lot more questions. And that's probably true for many people on this call. And I, and I hope what it's doing is making us all also think more about what is our role you know, as the protection cluster, as the different AORs. And um, our colleague from Burundi talked about the links between gender-based violence and, and trafficking. But I think there's, there's many links we know with child protection. There's also a lot of links with general protection. So, so I'm, I'm glad that we have our task team within the GPC. I hope more people will be motivated to, to look at, you know, how can we expand our work and do something um, around identification and around prevention. You know, I heard the, I think almost all of the speakers talked about, we can use technology not only to identify, but to prevent um, cases of, of trafficking in, in human, human beings. And, you know, clearly we heard a lot about uh, women and girls are, are the ones who are most targeted. Um, and, and I think really it's important, I hope everyone heard how many of the speakers talked about the importance of having the survivors themselves help lead the discussion and help design what we need to look for the remedies and and how we really need to to listen i think you know the, the six points that hannah gave us gave us some really concrete ideas but really i think you know we know for gbv also we need to to listen to survivors um, we need to listen to who's using technology who are working directly with survivors around services. Um, and and I, I also, I mean, it was very depressing, the one in 130, that's the first time I've heard that statistic and that's alarming. Um, but I also heard some hope and, and thank you for that example of the young people between 14 and 18 who are the ones who are sort of pushing those of us who are a bit older into learning more um, and opening new ideas for us to think about um, how can we address these issues collectively, um, not just as a protection sector, but making all these links between the United Nations system and the, the tech companies and, and the users. So I will leave it there. I don't know, William, if you want to say one more thing. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Actually, I want to say one more thing and hand over to, uh, uh, to Siobhan, to 
uh, to give us some some instructions, I would say. Uh, we have a task team on anti-trafficking. I see there is a lot of questions asking for uh, specific advice. Uh, I would highly encourage people who have who are asking for specific good practices to connect uh, with the task team of the Global Protection Cluster. I'm sure we can establish the connection between experts from, from field uh, to field. Siobhan, I pre-commit uh, to all your recommendations for us. You have heard all of this, you're working on this topic, you're accountable to many aspects of it. How can we help from the GPC? Give us the marching orders, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, William, and, and thank you very much to all the panelists and uh, all of those working in the field. Um, first, I would just note, and I think as has been highlighted, we have the legal and policy tools. We have endless examples of good practices, of policy guidance. We have the legal and nor normative framework um, to address this problem. The key gaps are in implementation. And I think what is surprising to me, perhaps, and uh, to others working in anti-trafficking, um, are the continuing gaps in knowledge around how to access these resources and how to implement them on the ground. Uh, and I think this goes back to something that William said at the very beginning, that even with all of the work that is ongoing, that we tend, we are still working in, in silos and too compartmentalized in our responses to the problem of trafficking in persons. So through the work of Global Protection Cluster and others, I think it's absolutely urgent that we break down those silos um, so that we ensure that those of you who are in the field, in humanitarian settings, in conflict settings, in crisis situations uh, are ready, uh, have the training, um, have the resources and capacity and support needed to prevent trafficking occurring, uh, and to identify those uh, at risk and being trafficked, um, including through the use of digital technologies. So the resources are there, but we need to implement them quite urgently um, on the ground. And I think that goes back um, to what was said, um, something that Hannah mentioned, uh, an example that we have, for example, 70 unique, that you had counted 70 unique um, tech tools that had been developed to identify or to assist in identifying victims of trafficking and risks of trafficking. Instead of continuing to duplicate this kind of work, we really need more effective sharing of these resources and these tools uh, and dissemination to those in the field who are on the front line who, who need to be able to react quickly. So that I think that sharing of information, that sharing of resources is absolutely critical. Um, what I would say is that states need to step up in terms of their responses, um, because I don't think we can rely on businesses or the tech sector. Voluntary compliance uh, hasn't worked, isn't working. Uh, there are too many risks. We need oversight and effective action from states uh, and international organizations to ensure accountability. Uh, for the prevention of trafficking online uh, and for ensuring access to protection. And yes, technology isn't a silver bullet. Technology is the, the means by which trafficking happens or through which we can take preventive action. Um, but the, the big tech sector in particular uh, needs to step up uh, and to allocate more resources and be more effective in its action. And in particular, in international cooperation. Um, particularly uh, in countries and in settings where there may, may be more difficulties in accessing information and remedies. Um, I think a key thing is that it is effective, affected groups who lead on this, who inform us as to what tools are most effective on the ground, what are the issues around connectivity or digital divides, whether it's linked to rural settings or it's a gender divide. Um, so that we can address those uh, as a matter of urgency. Um, I would go back to the, the point that Maya said, um, made that uh, we need to walk with children, we need to listen to children, we need to learn from children and young people and walk with them hand in hand. Uh, so looking at ensuring that children and young people have a voice, that they have access to technologies, um, 
that in the context of COVID-19, where we see closures of schools, collapse of informal economies, um, that we ensure that access to digital technology is not distorted, that it's not used in a way which is abusive and violative of human rights, but can actually be an important tool to prevent exploitation uh, and trafficking. And to conclude, I think to go back to the point that is made uh, around the gender dimensions, this is something in all anti-trafficking action, we talk about addressing root causes, uh, discrimination, violence against women, um, the gender dimensions, the structural gender dimensions of discrimination uh, and poverty. That contributes to and leads to and creates an environment in which trafficking happens uh, and women and girls in particular uh, are targeted. Um, and we need to be mindful also that we sometimes miss men and boys, that they become less visible uh, because they are not always perceived as vulnerable or uh, as there may be additional obstacles to disclosure of uh, experiences of exploitation, including trafficking. Um, but we really need to address those structural dimensions uh, and ensure that technology becomes a tool, a really useful tool, that we cooperate internationally through mutual legal assistance, through sharing of information, through training and capacity building uh, of justice sector actors, um, so that we can combat trafficking more effectively and use technology to support that work. Thank you. Javon, thank you. Thank you to all our panelists. Uh, thank you for all the participants. Please continue the engagement with the trafficking, anti-trafficking task team. Trafficking remains a crime that is most predictable in times of crisis. Our response to it must be as predictable as the crime and prevention needs to be as high as the risk, both in digital and physical space. And I think from today, acknowledging how more and more these two spaces are connected. Thank you everyone. Have a good afternoon and a good rest of the forum. Bye bye. Thank Hi, you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye.